Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the latest session of the DaVita PD webinar series. This covers the key clinical elements of managing patients on PD and is recommended for all DaVita nurses, medical directors, as well as any physician who has or plans to put patients on PD. Our series takes place on the first Friday of every month at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Since is a mix of physicians and DaVita teammates, we have about 150 people on the call today, and we're happy to see that there's so much growing interest around this therapy. Reminder, all of our webinar sessions are recorded and are available for on-demand access at kidneysupport.wex.com. Today's topic is infectious complications of PD, and now I'll pass on to Dr. John Moran, who will introduce today's speaker. John? Good afternoon. This is John Moran. I'm the uh, Vice President for Clinical Affairs, Home Modalities, Data Inc. And uh, really an extreme pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Joanne Bargeman from the University of Toronto. I could be formal about this, but I would like to say that Dr. Bargeman is a great, great nephrologist and a great, great speaker. If you look at her resume, you'll see that she's had 450 invited lectures worldwide, and she's come back from China and India. She is one of the leading experts on PD in the world, if not the leading expert. So, Dr. Bargman, please take it away. Hi, John, and thanks, uh, Myla. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those on the West Coast. Div has asked me to talk about uh, infectious complications of peritonitis, and I'll be focusing in this lecture on peritonitis. I, uh, I'm asked to give this disclaimer that uh, what you're going to hear today is actually my own presentation, my own opinions, and don't necessarily express the views of uh, DaVita. So that's what I'm going to talk about. First of all, why are we still talking and worried about peritonitis in 2011? We'll talk about how to make the diagnosis of this condition and the management of it, including some special situations with more atypical peritonitis. And, of course, the best management of peritonitis is to prevent it in the first place, and we'll just close very uh, quickly talking about prevention of peritonitis. So for those of you who are relatively new to the PD, I'd just like to tell you for a minute about the old way that PD was connected to patient. This schema shows the peritoneal cavity on the right and the catheter. And in the old days, the patient used to connect to the bag, and it was at the point of this connection that there was a potential for bacterial contamination. Then once the connection was made, if there was any contamination, it, it would dis infuse directly into the patient. And uh, the Italians realized the folly of this kind of thing and invented something called flush before fill. At this flush before fill connectology, when everyone else was getting PD peritonitis rates of one in every 18 patient months, they were claiming peritonitis rates of about one in every 40 patient months. And people really honestly didn't believe that their results and thought that they must have been too good to be true. Such before is a disconnect system, and I'll walk you through it. And this is basically the prototype for what we use now. So as you know, it's a double bag system in CAPD. So at the point of the connection, of course, we still have the same potential for bacterial contamination or inoculation of bacteria into the system. But now, instead of infusing that bacteria directly into the patient, the patient drains out their used peritoneal effluent into the drain bag and hopefully carries with them any bacteria that may have been inoculated into the system. Furthermore, they then flush a little bit of the fresh fluid directly from the new bag into the drip bag, hopefully getting rid of any remaining bacteria that may have, may have been inoculated at the time of the catheter connection. And only after those steps are done, then the patient fills with the fralicate. Now, with this new flush before fill, we know that PD peritonitis went from being once every year or so, and I remember in the 1980s when the nephrology units were filled with PD patients who were in with peritonitis, we the incidence of peritonitis started 
start to decline. So that was about one every 24 months in the 1990s, now perhaps one every 30 to 36 months. In my own unit, we've been clocking for the past several years about one episode every 45 months when you realize it is like one in almost every four years. So it's been a very gratifying decline in the incidence of PD peritonitis. However, when patients do get peritonitis, it is still a serious event. And it is certainly a cause of all these bad outcomes that you can see on your slide, including morbidity, a switch from PD to hemo, potential for damage to the peritoneal membrane, and of course, even death of the patient. This is a U.S. RDS data. This shows at 12 months how many hemodialysis patients in red have been hospitalized versus PD patients. And the same thing at 36 months. And you can see in the first 12 months that there's way more hospitalizations for hemodialysis patients for infectious complications or excess complications. And, of course, this is related probably to uh, PERMCAS. Whereas by 36 months, the hospitalization rate is really more or less the same. So there still is a significant hospitalization rate in peritoneal dialysis patients for infectious complications. Why would an episode of peritonitis cause a patient to leave PD? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Reasons. The patient may never want to do PD again, and there's an interesting study to suggest that doctors and nurses underestimate the amount of pain associated with an episode of peritonitis. The neurologist, especially if they're insecure about PD, may never want the patient to do it again and think that if the patient had an episode of peritonitis, it means that PD doesn't work and therefore they should go to chemo. Commonly, but definitely we see it, the patients may develop a rapid transport status after the peritonitis and have trouble removing fluid. And finally, if a patient has a really bad episode of peritonitis and the catheter has to come out, the empty peritoneal cavity may form adhesions or scar tissue. And even if the patient wants to go back on peritoneal dialysis, there's so many adhesions that it's mechanically difficult for the patient to return to PD. So all these different reasons can lead to the so-called technique failure or a switch off of PD to hemodialysis. Peritonitis can cause death. We all know about cardiovascular disease as the principal cause of death in our dialysis patients, but of course there still is a significant chunk of the pie where our dialysis patients are dying as a result of infection in the case of the PD patient because of peritonitis shows the D over P creatinine, which is a measure of peritoneal transport status. This is before the patient's got PD peritonitis, and this is afterwards. And you can see that there is an increase in the delicate to plasma ratio of creatinine, which means that the episode of peritonitis has made the patient become a more rapid transporter. And uh, this is in patients who had peritonitis, had their catheter removed, had a new catheter put in, and you can see that their peritoneal membrane is not functioning in the same way because they've become a more rapid transporter all through this event. And this ultrafiltration at four hours before and after this episode of peritonitis, and you can see overall that there's a decline in ultrafiltration, which of course goes along with the patient becoming a more rapid transporter. This is death rate in some multicenter studies, and you can see it varies from from place to place, and of course the death rate for a uh, gram-negative peritonitis is different from the death rate of a coagulase-negative peritonitis, but overall, the number I keep in my mind is that the average death rate is about 3% for any given episode of PD peritonitis. So because of all those things, hospitalization, technique failure, uh, changes in the membrane, and death, this is why we're still talking about PD peritonitis in 2011. Now make the diagnosis. ISPD guidelines suggest that the patient should have two of these three. The CR, an increased white count in the PD fluid, and that should be more than 50% polys. Abdominal pain is the skin, and a positive culture of the effluent. And if a patient has two of these three, it's sufficient to make a diagnosis of peritonitis. Of course, is what a cloudy effluent 
effluent looks like. Uh, normally with a clear effluent, you should be able to read newspaper, uh, newsprint behind it. But when the effluent is cloudy, you can't do that. But if, uh, there's a dental diagnosis in patients. And although that sounds really simplistic, uh, I've just seen so many cases where people miss this idea that abdominal pain in a patient who's on PD is not always necessarily peritonitis. So this is a true story of a patient who we knew had gallbladder disease and came in for cholecystitis, and then came back a few months later. He was a PD patient, and he came back with abdominal pain. And again, the resident just said, oh, it's a PD patient with abdominal pain. It must be peritonitis. And uh, he didn't look, examine the patient. He didn't look at the PD fluid, which was clear. And next morning when we examined him, the fluid was clear. And instead of having that generalized abdominal pain of PD peritonitis, his pain was in the right upper quadrant. So he didn't have peritonitis. He had another episode of cholecystitis. And so in uh, academic medicine, we talk about the teachable moment. And I to my residents, remember, patients are entitled to have other causes of abdominal pain besides uh, peritonitis, yada, yada, yada. And then a week later, another PD patient presented with abdominal pain. Again, the fluid was clear. And instead of having diffuse abdominal pain, the pain was localized to one spot. Again, the, the resident said, oh, it's a PD patient with abdominal pain, must be peritonitis. But here's her CT scan. Let me just orient you to the CT scan. So here's the skin layer right here. I hope everyone can see my cursor. And here's the fat layer. And here's the muscle layer. And what you see here is a loop of bowel is poked out of the peritoneal cavity and is incarcerated. And that is exactly where her pain was. So in fact, her, her uh, abdominal pain was due to an incarcerated hernia and not due to P. peritonitis. And again, the clue here was that pain was very exquisite and very localized, which went along with this incarcerated hernia. Lots of different things that can cause abdominal pain in a PD patient, and here's just a part list. Simple feel that PD patients may be more prone to pancreatitis the general population, and so on. So really, anything that can cause abdominal pain may occur in a peritoneal dialysis patient. So you have to keep that in mind. Also, the pain may have some other cause, and then secondary to that, do get through peritonitis. So that strangulated, incarcerated hernia may leak bacteria into the peritoneal cavity and lead secondarily to a peritonitis. And same with all these other surgical conditions. And they can lead to abdominal pain just because of the conditions themselves and may or may not leak bacteria into the peritoneal cavity and lead to a secondary PD peritonitis. So that's why it's important to examine the patient and convince yourself that their abdominal pain is generalized and not localized to one particular part of their abdomen. Another thing is that not all clotted fluid is the result of PD peritonitis. So causes, for example, eosinophilic peritonitis, which I'll talk about in a second. Every so often there may be something that is a chemical contaminant and lead to what's called a sterile peritonitis or chemical peritonitis. So some batches of icodextrin in the old days caused this. There was some uh, type of vancomycin that led to a chemical peritonitis. And something I want everyone to remember, too, if someone's not been feeling well and they leave their uh, PD fluid in situ, let's say for 24 or 48 hours, and then come to the emergency room because they, they're they not feeling well and haven't done an exchange, it's very possible that their effluent may be a little bit cloudy. And that is just because it's been sitting around in the peritoneal cavity for a long time. And it may have a cell count of 300 or 400, but that doesn't automatically mean that they've got PD peritonitis. It may just be because that fluid has been hanging around for a long time without having exchanges. Into uh, had episodically cloudy fluid, so there really was no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes it was cloudy, sometimes it was clear. 
They would set bags for her cell count. They were always normal. It never grew anything. And this chyloperitoneum, or a leakage of lymphatic fluid from some uh, chunks of lymphatics in the peritoneal cavity into the PD fluid, and it has this milky white appearance to it, which is actually looks different to the trained eye than the typical cloudy effluent of PD peritonitis. And triglycerides, uh, because that's what's in the chyle, then you can see that it is elevated. It is episodic because it depends on the uh, fat intake of the patient. And it may become uh, chylous like that when the patient has had a fatty meal. But if they're eating non-fat foods, then it'll be clear. So that's why it may be episodically cloudy. Cynic peritonitis is seen very often when someone comes with a new P catheter. They come in for training, their fluid is a little bit cloudy, and they have a mildly elevated uh, cell count in the PD fluid, but there will be way more eosinophils than there usually are. And, uh, of course, the culture has no growth in this particular presentation. You can either uh, treat with empiric antibiotics until the culture comes back as no growth, or you can just watch and wait. Most of these are self-limited and go away in a few days, although very rarely it can persist for a couple of months. No one really understands this, but it's really classic to be with a new catheter. So maybe something about the new catheter or the way it's sterilized or something like that, that in vulnerable patients will lead to this transient eosinophilic peritonitis. And usually we just treat by watching it, although if it goes on for a long time, some people have recommended either low doses of corticosteroids or antihistamines for this particular condition. Another thing that's really weird, and you wouldn't think about it, is that a patient may call up and say that their fluid is cloudy when it's actually bloody. So although it may look like the picture that you're seeing, they may call you and say that it's cloudy. So make sure you, you know what you're dealing with and ask specifically if it's bloody or red or pink or whatever. Back to true PD peritonitis. How does the bacteria get into the peritoneal cavity? As I showed you before, there's inoculation of just bacteria that's floating in the air, floating in the skin uh, during the time of the connection for the exchange. Or there may be bacteria around the catheter exit site that may slowly migrate along the course of catheter through the tunnel and into the peritoneal cavity. And there are patients that present with uh, PD peritonitis with the same organism as an exit site infection. And the assumption there is that the bacteria has connected between the exit site, traveled with the catheter down into the peritoneal cavity. You can go what's called transmurally or across the wall of the bowel. For example, in diverticulosis, very often there are little micro perforations of a thin wall diverticuli, and that can allow bowel bacteria to go across these perforations into the peritoneal cavity. It probably happens in lots of people who are not on PD with diverticulosis, but if there's ba bacteria that goes into a normal peritoneal cavity, it is filled with antibodies and all sorts of bacteria-fighting uh, things, and therefore it doesn't cause peritonitis. But in a patient on PD, this bacteria goes into the PD fluid, and it's a good culture medium and can end up leading to a peritonitis due to all associated organisms. Very rarely, there can be uh, vaginal organisms that can go across the vaginal vault into the peritoneal fluid. And even more rarely, people who get a bacteremia for some other reason, emphasize that for some other reason, may then secondarily see peritoneal cavity with that bacteria. But I want to emphasize something, and that's that if a person has bacteremia for some other cause, it really can seed the peritoneal cavity. But if you've got PD peritonitis as the first event, it hardly ever causes bacteremia. So though we let our patients make a choice uh, between peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis, if a patient, if you have a patient who you absolutely have to avoid bacteremia, such a patient with a heart valve or with hardware in their hip or something like that, that really can't allow them to get secondarily infected, I try to encourage those patients to go on to peritoneal dialysis 
rather than hemodialysis. Because at least if they do get peritonitis, they're not going to develop secondary bacteremia. Whereas, of course, if they get an infectious complication in hemo, that usually involves bacteremia and the risk of seeding the heart valve or the hip replacement. Thing with respect to hematogenous seeding, because if you do have this primary bacteremia, it can secondarily seed the peritoneal cavity, is if you have a patient who might become bacteremic because of a procedure, you should use antibiotic prophylaxis. And that includes patients who are going, for example, for uh, gum cleaning as part of uh, dental work or colonoscopy. We've had a patient develop bacteremia and secondary uh, peritonitis with colposcopy and so on. And as another point, these patients should always be drained, go empty for these kinds of GI or GU instrumentation. So true story, this is one of my patients doing real well on PD, and he goes to his dentist for a checkup. And the dentist asks him before he starts if he has any medical problems. And you think he would say, yes, I'm on dialysis, but he didn't. He just said, I have some kidney problems. So the, kid, so the dentist went ahead and did cleaning with an antibiotic prophylaxis, and the next day the patient develop peritonitis with a classical mouth-associated organism. So it's a proof of principle for this antibiotic prophylaxis. Probably the, the biggest player are colonoscopies. And if you have a patient who's going for colonoscopy, it's really important that they go for it empty and that they get antibiotic prophylaxis. And you can find out more about that um, in the uh, guidelines, the ISPD guidelines that I'll refer to uh, soon. So diagnosis and the differential diagnosis. Now, if you do have a patient with PD peritonitis, how do you manage them? So the principles, of course, are to start treatment quickly. I had a patient who reported cloudy fluid and abdominal pain. I told them to come to the emergency room. I went down to the emergency room, and it's like six hours later, and they still haven't gotten their antibiotics. And I said, why not? And the nurse said, well, the next exchange isn't due till 6 o'clock. And, of course, that's nonsense. You should stop, uh, you know, out and give them antibiotics as quickly as possible. Send the fluid that you've drained out for culture and cell count and start the antibiotic as soon as possible. You need to cover for all possibilities, including gram positive and gram negative, until you know what you're dealing with. You may ask for a gram stain, but I wouldn't change the therapy based on the result of the gram stain. I would wait for the actual culture reports before adjusting the antibiotics. Uh, and then, you know, you have to watch the patient and see that they're getting better. And getting better, of course, involves falling peritoneal fluid white count and a reduction in the abdominal pain. We either looked at whether the peritoneal white count can predict whether a patient is going to fail therapy or not. And interestingly, the white count at presentation on day one did not predict outcome. So some can have a really high white count on day one, and it doesn't really uh, predict whether their peritonitis is going to get better or not. But by day three, if the cell count is still more than 1,000, the patient had on an average about a nine-fold greater chance of treatment failure and the uh, catheter having to be removed. It's really more telling the white count on day three than the presentation white count on day one. And these are both controversial, but uh, you know, if you use a lot of vancomycin, we had a terrible problem with vancomycin resistant enterococcus. It was like an epidemic, and uh, so in our unit, we try to avoid vancomycin if possible. Having said that, there are lots of other units that routinely use vancomycin and don't seem to have a problem with VRE. This leads to the larger importance important point, especially for the medical directors, and this is that you should know your local microbiologic climate. So no organisms are prominent in your area and uh, what kind of antibiotic resistance patterns you're typically dealing with. Because, of course, you know, what goes on in Los Angeles may be different than what goes on microbiologically in Maine. So you have to know your local microbiology. The other thing that's a little bit controversial, but is to try to avoid, if possible, prolonged courses of aminoglycosides, because this may lead to a decline in residual renal function, although that's controversial, and perhaps ototoxicity, and that's also controversial.
Sir Seal. It's not getting better, especially in in five days or so, especially if it's one of those that we know are bad players, like Staph aureus or Pseudomonas, then consider removing the catheter. The longer it goes on, if you let it drag on, it's a very catabolic condition, and the patient may really decline. And as I said, there's this 3% average mortality with an episode of a PD peritonitis. Also, it can cause a crude damage to the perineal membrane the longer you wait. I think uh, most people would agree if the patient grows a fungus or a yeast that it is not going to get better with uh, even antifungal uh, antibiotics and the catheter should be removed as soon as possible. When the peritoneal brain is inflamed, uh, everybody becomes a rapid transporter and there may be problems with ultrafiltration. I don't find that in real life to be such a big problem because patients don't typically eat and drink a whole lot when they're having a PD peritonitis. But theoretically, they could have problems with ultrafiltration and fluid overload. So the catheter. As I mentioned, if the PD peritonitis is not getting better, Hold on a sec. Surgical peritonitis with bowel perforation. If I said, if there's like a aureus peritonitis and a staph aureus exit site infection, hold on. I'm thinking so much. Uh, when there's staph aureus peritonitis and, and exit organism, the assumption is that the whole catheter is caused and it's not going to get better and you might as well take out the catheter. And as I mentioned, fungal and yeast peritonitis. More the decision to take out a catheter electively. So having recurrent peritonitis with the same organism typically coagulates negative staph. It may be that the patient's making the same connection problem over and over again, or it could be that the catheter is colonized with coagulase negative staph. Again, it's sort of a judgment about whether you take out the catheter or not. Sometimes the peritonitis gets better, but you still grow the organism in the fluid. And that means that the intraperitoneal portion of the catheter is very likely colonized with it. And again, it's probably a good reason to take out the catheter. Exit infection is very controversial, and uh, you don't have to automatically remove uh, a P catheter just because someone has an exit site infection. And uh, often, a course of antibiotics, either local or systemic, may get rid of the exit site infection. Sometimes these catheter removals can be done with a new catheter put in at the same time, and that saves the patient a separate uh, procedure. But this can be done with uh, appropriate antibiotic coverage so that the new catheter isn't contaminated with the um, bacteria that's remaining in the peritoneal cavity. We'll see whether the patient needs to come into hospital. Uh, we talked about antibiotic choice. What about the pain? As I said, it's felt that probably doctors and nurses underestimate the pain of PD peritonitis. So uh, sometimes just the flushing in and out. If a patient comes in with a really painful Paradis, it you just like three or four in and out exchanges that washes away the mediators of the inflammation and the pain and can be helpful uh, for the patient's uh, symptoms. We may give patients painkillers that it may impair their dexterity, and if they're doing their own dialysis and you send them home, that's the theoretical problem. So that may be a decision for hospitalization or something like that. And as I mentioned, uh, you have to prepare for ultrafiltration problems because the patient will become a rapid transporter at least during the course of the acute peritonitis. But again, um, I don't think it's really an important clinical issue. About the antibiotics. If it's a gram positive and it's coagulase negative staph or staph epidermidis, the ISPD recommends to treat for two weeks. The more difficult organisms like Staph aureus or probably uh, the new extended uh, spectrum beta-lactamase organisms, you should treat uh, longer. If it's gram-negative, uh, the recommendation is for about 21 days. So those are just, uh, you know, it's your judgment, but that's the recommendation of the ISPD. Now, this is a patient that we had a few years ago. Uh, he was doing fine. He presented with PD peritonitis. 
is fitted on the usual ISPD recommendations with sazolin and ceftazidime, and his PD fluid grew acinetobacter. And this acinetobacter was sensitive to salisporins. So because of that, we stopped the sazolin and we continued the ceftazidime. And we also gave him uh, fungal prophylaxis, which I'll come to later. So here's his initial cell count. And by three, you can see that his white count was undetectable. Great. Day six, white count undetectable. Great. And then all of a sudden on, gray, on day 10, his PD fluid cell count went up again. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that acinetobacter is of a group of uh, bacteria that are called the spice organisms, and that's because of the first letters of, of them. And what happens with these organisms is that they start out being sensitive to cephalosporins, but over the course of treatment, they become resistant. That's why this patient freshly got better and then got worse again. He was getting his antibiotic, he was taking it, but his acinobacter mutated and became resistant to the cephalosporin over the course of the therapy. So there's really uh, scary bacteria out there. They're called the ESBL organisms, and as I said, they inactivate these third-generation cephalosporins, and initially you'll think that they're effective, but then they quickly become resistant. And so there's all these different patterns of antibiotic resistance that are coming, and that's why you have to know the microbiologic climate around where you're dialyzing your patients. And it's also really helpful if you can get an infectious disease person who knows something about peritoneal dialysis to work with you and your unit. There's a lot of ID people who don't have the first idea about peritoneal dialysis, but if you can if you can work with someone and educate them and get them to help you, it can be very helpful for the management of these kinds of complications. I recommend too strongly to you the website www.ispd.org. That is the site of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, which, by the way, I encourage everybody to join. And uh, if you go there and under guidelines, you will find the most current recommendations. And I use this too. If I have someone who comes in with weird peritonitis, I can just go to uh, the Internet, look this up, and see what the current recommendations are uh, for treating the peritonitis. Again, you have to modify this by knowing what your local microbiology is uh, all about. But this website is very helpful. In a couple of special cases, one is pseudomonas peritonitis. Uh, most people believe that if someone's got pseudomonas, they need two, not one, antibiotics and should be treated for 21 days. Uh, some of these will get better. However, if the pseudomonas peritonitis is also occurring at the same time as a pseudomonas exit site infection, again, it means that whole tract is colonized with pseudomonas, it's not going to get better, and you might as well take out the catheter. And pseudomonas is such a nasty, sticky organism that I wouldn't put a new catheter at the same time. I would take out the old one, leave them on hemo for, I don't know, no one knows the right answer, maybe four weeks or so, and then put in a new catheter after that. Uh, this shows uh, the success of treatment when someone has both a pseudomonas exocyte and a peritonitis. And to show you, if there's just peritonitis, there's about a 30-35% cure. But when there's a concomitant exocyte infection, it's very rare to have a cure. And that's why you might as well take out the catheter. Now, people are under the impression that if someone just has a pseudomonas exocyte infection alone, that the catheter has to come out. And I don't think that's the case. Very often, these will uh, subside with antibiotic therapy. And same with pseudomonas peritonitis alone. So the take-home message is if they've got an isolated pseudomonas exocyte infection or an isolated pseudomonas peritonitis, I would give them a trial of therapy. It's only when they've got both together that I would remove the PD catheter. If they present with multiple gram-negative organisms, it's probably that transmural or transbowel leak. And in addition, we usually recommend to add coverage for anaerobic organisms, which may not grow out so easily, but may be there. But you assume they're like a ruptured bowel 
and you give anaerobic uh, coverage. You should also call a surgeon, not that you necessarily have to have them have surgery, but they should be aware of this patient in case they don't get better and indeed they need uh, some sort of exploratory laparotomy or something like that. So the surgeon should just uh, be aware about these kinds of patients. Here's a patient uh, of mine that I learned a lot from. This patient uh, had fistula constructed for hemo, but they uh, were educated and changed their mind and decided to do PD. So he had a PD catheter put in. He was trained on cycler. Everything was fine. Then he developed abdominal pain, cloudy fluid, and also developed a C. difficile diarrhea. Retention was admitted to hospital grew a whole bunch of uh, bowel-associated uh, organisms, and a bunch of antibiotics were added. And we did a CT scan, which showed diverticulosis, which maybe was the source of bacteria leaving the bowel and going into the peritoneal fluid. But uh, that's all it showed. And in fact, I find CT scans in PD peritonitis usually to be uh, enormously unhelpful. Anyway, um, what we have is something called dry abdomen therapy. And because he was leaking bacteria through the diverticuli, or at least that was our theory, we decided, well, let's not let it leak into the sugar-rich PD fluid. And we left him dry. He still had some residual renal function. And he actually had a fistula that we could have used, but we didn't even have to use it. We just left him dry for a few days. And that allows the natural defenses of the peritoneal cavity to go to work. And maybe, maybe what happened was this microperforation sealed itself up. Uh, it was this dry abdomen therapy. We continued with antibiotic uh, coverage intravenously. As I mentioned, we added anaerobic coverage because it was a bleak kind of a, a peritonitis, and uh, he got better. So I'm sure this man was going to lose his catheter, but uh, after a couple of weeks, the cell count was less than 100, and we dodged this bullet. So keep in mind if you have some with uh, what looks like maybe leaking uh, leaking bacteria through div diverticuli to continue the antibiotics, but perhaps uh, intravenously, and leave them dry for a couple of days to see whether this leak will seal itself up who was a diabetic and had had four episodes of peritonitis, lots of intraperitoneal antibiotics. Uh, now he comes in with another peritonitis. It's Klebsiella. He gets better. He's sent home on the tobramycin. And then, like that other patient, on day 10, when he was be getting better, he now presents again with fluid and abdominal pain. So this looks a lot like that other patient. Here's his initial presentation, day two, day three, everything's great. And on day 11, he sends with a PD leukocytosis. So at this time, unfortunately, the gram stain showed fungal elements. And this is the only time, in my opinion, where a gram stain actually mandates a change in therapy. I've said before, I wouldn't change therapy just because you get gram positive or gram negative. I would wait for the culture. But if you get back a gram stain that says that there's fungi, then I think you need to act on that. And that's an indication for removal of the PD uh, catheter. And there's been a big change over the last decade from Canada Albicans to non-Albicans Candida, like this patient had. So his catheter was removed. Unfortunately, uh, uh, he had a MI around this. This is probably why these patients die um, from from the peritonitis. He was changed to hemo, and it shows why fungal peritonitis is such a serious complication, and it's associated with a high mortality rate and leads to technique failure in many many patients. The risk factors for fungal peritonitis, frequent peritonitis with the use of repeat uh, uh, antibiotics intraperitoneally, just antibiotic therapy in general. Think about your diabetics who have got infected necrotic toes and they go to whoever looks after them in your area and they put on like three different oral antibiotics for eight weeks. So that's a risk factor too. And you can see the other risk factors too, including, of course, patients who are on prednisone or other immunosuppressive drugs. So <clears throat> what we think is going on is the following. This is supposed to be my artistic representation of a loop of bowel. So here's the bowel. You've got the fungi and the bacteria living normally with each other in the normal situation. 
garden. And if you add repeated courses of antibiotics for that necrotic toe or for repeated bouts of bacterial peritonitis, then you kill off all the bacteria in the bowel and you get an overgrowth of fungi. What happens is that those fungi leak out, at least this is what's felt to happen, they leak out of the bowel into the peritoneal cavity and lead to the fungal peritonitis. So how do you treat that? Again, you can go to the uh, ISPD.org guidelines and look at those. And again, it depends what's used in your particular area. We tend to use conazole where we are, but again, there's lots of other things but definitely the catheter should be removed. And there's just too many studies now, and here's the most recent one that shows the longer you wait before you remove the catheter. Like you think you're the one that's going to have the patient with fungal peritonitis that will get better. And if you wait and you wait and you wait, that there's a higher risk of death. So we found the exact same thing in a study that we published about uh, a decade before this, that the longer you wait to remove the catheter, the greater the chance of death. The answer is, of course, call the surgeon and try to get the catheter out as soon as possible. And uh, we all give antifungal therapy anyway, even though the catheter has been removed. No one knows the, the right length of time. We tend to treat for about a couple of weeks after removal of the catheter. And uh, as I said, if you have someone who's good in infectious disease, you might want to get them involved, especially if it's a weird kind of a fungus. Like we had a patient uh, a couple of years ago with aspergillus. Uh, PD peritonitis. So it's good to have an ID person to help you out with those kinds of th things. Now, can these patients ever come back to peritoneal dialysis? We, we wait about a couple of months, and some, t some patients make a lot of adhesions, and they make so many adhesions that you can't even mechanically put the catheter back. And I don't know why, but other patients make no adhesions at all, and there's no problem to put back another catheter. And it's pretty hard to to predict this beforehand. There's some studies that say that maybe nuclear medicine studies help with this, but uh, or CT scans don't help. You can see adhesions with CT scans. So we tell the patients about a 50-50 chance that if you want to go back to PD that we'll be able to get a functional catheter. And if you can, try to get a person putting the catheter in to do it laparoscopically so they can actually look for adhesions and analyze any adhesions uh, that they may find. The best treatment is prevention, and maybe patients who are getting a lot of conventional antibiotics should receive antifungal therapy to stop that fungal overgrowth in the bowel. So there are lots of studies to look at this. This is a, a list of them if you want to look them up. Here's the control rate with uh, no antifungal prophylaxis, and here's the rate with antifungal prophylaxis. And the bottom line is that the, the group that had higher control rates of fungal peritonitis did see gratifying reduction when used fungal prophylaxis, but groups that had baseline low rates didn't really see any change with the prolaxis. This is the most recent one uh, that just came out, and uh, it shows a reduction in fungal peritonitis when antifungal prophylaxis is given at the time of bacterial peritonitis. In my own unit, we do recommend that the patients take a microstat uh, during the time and for one week after they take conventional antibiotics for, for any reason. Uh, again, whether it works or not, a fungal peritonitis is just such a, uh, a bad development for the patients that I personally feel it's worthwhile for them to take the uh, mycostatin if they're taking conventional antibiotics. The prophylaxis will depend on the on the on the uh, baseline rate. As I said, mycostatin's a safe medication. It's just really the inconvenience of having to uh, take it uh, several times a day. But I think it's all better than getting uh, a secondary fungal uh, peritonitis. Your own uh, unit should not have more than 20% culture negative uh, peritonitis. So that's a, a, an important quality issue for. For you. If it's culture negative and they're getting better on the empiric therapy, most people will assume that this is a fastidious gram positive and they stop coverage for the gram negative but keep going whatever they're using for the gram positive and treat for a couple of weeks. If the patient is not getting better on empiric antibiotics, then maybe something weird is going on and you should reculture 
Again, talk to your lab and make sure they're doing all the right points. And again, this is all spelled out in those ISPD guidelines. Think about weird peritonitis such as tuberculosis, peritonitis, and remember that episodically cloudy fluid that I showed you before uh, in, the, in the chyloperitoneum. Specialized uh, situations, as I said to you before, uh, uh, typical PD peritonitis, the abdominal pain is generalized. So if you have a patient where the abdominal pain is all in one quadrant of the abdomen, think about something else going on with a secondary surgical peritonitis. So in my career, we've uncovered three cases of appendicitis in patients who presented with PD peritonitis. And again, this is because their pain was really amplified in the right lower quadrant. And same with diverticulitis with pain being worse in the left lower quadrant. Don't forget to look for hernias because a strangulated hernia may leak bacteria and lead to a secondary peritonitis. So it's important to have a quick look and make sure you're not missing a strangulated hernia. And finally, very rarely, a patient may present with almost like a toxic shock kind of syndrome where they've uh, got exquisitely severe abdominal pain, they're hypotensive, they're vasodilated, and this may be either a surgical catastrophe or it may be staph aureus that is secreting toxins. And in that case, what we usually recommend is to do rapid exchanges in these patients to exchange out the putative toxin. And I think we've done that a couple of times that it's been life-saving for the patient. It's a very rare event, however. Only the best treatment, as I said, is not to let it happen in the first place. So pay training. What about new so-called biocompatible PD solutions that you don't have in states? In fact, the study results are very mixed, and there really isn't an overwhelming signal that these new solutions lead to a lower incidence of PD peritonitis. I'll talk about root cause analysis. And actually another ISPD guideline that's coming out either next month or the month after that focuses purely on the prevention of PD peritonitis. So there's not really great evidence that the more you train the patient, the, the less uh, PD peritonitis they'll get, but it's, it makes sense. So really, uh, within the constraints of your own unit, you should make sure that your patient has as the most kind of training you can. Try to have a home visit to see what the patient's setup is like. That can be very instructive uh, to you. You should be taught by a nurse with special expertise in, in P. Uh, no one knows about single versus uh, group training. Uh, again, a pa it should be taught by someone who knows something about adult learning principles. We uh, take the tack that if anyone presents with peritonitis, we retrain them. If had any interruption of PD, let's say they came in with a GI bleed and they were in the hospital for two weeks and uh, not doing their own PD, we'll do what's called a technique check on them before they're discharged to make sure that they remember all the steps in doing their PD uh, exchanges. And as I said, home visits can be very helpful. So it's a patient who, uh, she's 87 now. She's been on PD in my program for seven years. And she started with a lot of residual kidney function. Because of that, she was on night cycler and she was dry during the day. And she, her turbulent weight was a dry weight because she was dry during the day. So that was fine. And now with her renal function declining, she now had fluid in during the day. And what she would do is she would weigh herself between her midday exchange. And after six years of not having one episode of peritonitis, she developed a coagulase negative staph peritonitis. Now, you might have said, well, you know, it's been six years, that's great, it's one of those things. But what turned out was that when she would weigh herself, she, when she went to do her mid exchange, she pulled off the green tab, she drained her effluent, and then she would just take that green tab and slip it back on her connection, walk over to weigh herself while she was dry, and then take that tab off again and do another connection. And we thought that maybe that was the reason that why after six years she developed this coagulase negative staph peritonitis. So this is what I mean by root cause analysis. So what we told her to do was just we added two kilos to her uh, target weight and told her to weigh herself with the two liters uh, in. And at least up to now, she's had no further episodes of peritonitis. So don't assume that peritonitis 
is just one of those things. Every episode has some cause. We may or may not figure it out, but it's got a cause. And uh, we have peritonitis rounds where we, we review our peritonitis events. What I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon, let me just summarize the important points. To adjust the empiric therapy based not on the gram stain, but on the sensitivities. Always examine the patient. Look, make sure they don't have a concomitant exit or tunnel and fin. Make sure you're not missing a strangulated hernia. If there's multiple bowel organisms uh, in the PD peritonitis, consider some sort of uh, abdominal catastrophe or ruptured diverticuli or something like that in the differential diagnosis. Again, depending on your local microbiology, you may want to avoid the use of vancomycin if possible and avoid extended use of aminoglycosides. If the patient's not getting better after about four or five days, Give consideration to rethinking the peritonitis or taking out the catheter altogether. It's a still a significant event for, for the patients, and we have to pay a lot of attention to training the patient in the proper technique. Even the nurses and the trained nurses should be uh, retrained every few years to make sure they haven't forgotten anything. And don't forget about this website, uh, which has the guidelines uh, about the treatment of the peritonitis, and as I said, coming up the... Uh, uh, prevention of PD peritonitis. Antifungal prophylaxis at the time of antibiotic administration may prevent the development of fungal peritonitis, especially in units that have a high baseline rate of fungal peritonitis. We use it in my unit even though we don't have a high baseline rate because I think the risk-benefit uh, favors that. But the best treatment, as always, is prevention with uh, training, retraining, and this root cause analysis for every episode. So fungal peritonitis, take out the catheter. A uh, set of patients may be able to go back to PD. This goes for uh, when the catheter is removed for either fungal or bacterial peritonitis. Um, if a patient has a pseudomonas exocyte infection or a pseudomonas peritonitis, each of those in isolation, I think they deserve a trial of therapy. It's only if they have both together that you take out the catheter. And don't forget about this dry abdomen therapy, a way to treat enteric peritonitis to allow a, a microperforation to heal itself out. I call it getting out of the abdomen and just giving it a chance to heal up, and that can sort of help you dodge a bullet sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bajman. That was absolutely fantastic. That was a lot of ground. I guess we've got time for a couple of questions. There are facilitate questions for us. At the time, I would like to remind everyone... In order to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. And your first question comes from mine of Tracy Milligan. You yes, you were talking about organisms for the spice, and I was just curious in your practice if you have a patient who has peritonitis and they come back with one of those organisms, do you add a different antibiotic at the time? or do you just go ahead and keep them on the antibiotic and just do more frequent um, cell counts to see how they're doing? Yeah, we change. When we get one of the spice organisms, we, we change and we'll use an aminoglycoside. Thank you. And even our nurses know that and tell the residents. So, uh, you know, the, the resident will just go to give the empiric therapy and the nurse will say, no, 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 that's a, a spice organism. You may have to rethink the antibiotic choice. There you go. Question comes from the line of Babu Sagaretti. Your line is open. Okay. Um, uh, excellent uh, talk, Dr. Brett. Thank you. And um, so the three questions I have. One is the antibiotic prophylaxis, the antifungal prophylaxis. Um, how, like, uh, is there a duration of antibiotics that will guide you, or you just use it on all and, uh, people with peritonitis? If they've got PD peritonitis, that means they're going to get antibiotics for at least two weeks. Yes, we use antifungal prophylaxis for that. If someone has, let's say, uh, uh, you know, something the family doctor is going to give them three days of antibiotics for, I, I don't think I'd bother for that. But if they're going to get like a prolonged course, like and that's like one week plus, then I use fungal prophylaxis. Again, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. It's just what I do. 
other question in uh, prevention is you know a lot of a lot of the time sometimes it happens where there is a small leak that happens in the catheter or sometimes you know the catheter breaks and then they immediately clamp and the the thought is to give prophylaxis is your uh, antibody yes. prophylaxis what is your opinion on that yeah i think that's a good idea um again we've had patients who have had um what's called this wet contamination and they don't tell us so get any antibiotic prophylaxis and then they present with with tendonitis so i think that antibiotic prophylaxis does help in in that case so yes i i would recommend treatment for wet contamination the other is it's an interesting thing which i have a patient who we been having club bags on and off and it turned out that she had ovarian cancer really none, interesting none of the investigations that we have done because we done did a ct scan just to see why she's having she has high white count she does have occasional abdominal pain and but nothing grew and intermittent cloudy bags for over a period of a couple of months so we couldn't figure out and then i had them do a gynecological examination and find ultrasound it showed a small mass on the ovary and so i switched her to hemodialysis then she started developing cystitis oh and so when we did the you know the c125 it's more than 1000 so she happened to have ovarian cancer so is there anything that uh, you can share the experience or something about that or? no but it makes perfect sense what you're saying and you know when ovarian cancer metastasizes it can metastasize to the peritoneal cavity maybe there were like micro metastases that were causing uh, episodic inflammation and that's why there was the episodic cloudy fluid okay. you should write that up <laughs> oh, thank you and your question comes from the line of Alina Gruea Your line is open. Hi, Dr. Barman. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is for colonoscopies. When patients go for a colonoscopy who are on peritoneal dialysis, do you have any idea of what kind of um, antibiotic therapy they should be on? Uh, we have a protocol for that. Mm-hmm. It's also on the ISPD website. Okay. Um, and I don't remember, but I think we give them oral moxicillin and tobramycin. Uh, in their last well before they go for the procedure and the most important thing they have to be drained yeah. they should be empty for the procedure okay you don't um you don't want them getting anything iv during the procedure i guess they could you okay. know that, that, i i don't think that's unreasonable if you can do it uh you know ip the night before or something i think that's fine you know as long as they get they're getting uh the, the proper antibiotics and they're empty for the procedure Okay, the other thing is uh is there any way I can get a copy of your presentation so I can uh, share it with the doctors? I think it's on uh my you can help me with this, but I think it's going to be available on the website. Oh, okay, great. It, it all of our webinar sessions are recorded. You can play them back at any time. I think at this point since we are a few minutes past 3, we're going to go ahead and stop our webinar here. I would like to take a moment to thank everyone for participating and I'd like to especially thank our speaker Dr. Joanne Bargman for taking time out of her busy schedule to talk with us today. Thank you. Please one uh be sure to join us for the next webinar that is scheduled for Friday, November 4th where Dr. Tom Tucker will present the pros and cons of CDP versus CCPD and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you everyone.